Meta. As you know, my name is David. I am the creator and host of CVS. In this episode of Meta, I'm going to talk a little bit about the scandal. I'm going to talk about Noah, St. Peter, and Pope Francis, because they are one. They are united in Jesus Christ, and they share a mission, which is to get everyone onto the ark, the one ark, outside of which there is no salvation possible. The popes, preeminently St. Peter, the first pope, the popes are antitypes of Noah, meaning that Noah is a type of the vicar of Christ. He guards the ark. He invites people onto the ark. The ark, of course, being the church outside of which there is no salvation possible. And the popes guard the church. They guard the faith. And they invite people in to the faith, into the church, outside of which there is no salvation. There are differences among these three men. The patriarch Noah, the first pope, St. Peter, and our current Holy Father, Pope Francis. But in essentials, they are one. There's that old Catholic saying, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, and in all things, charity. Well, it's in this last category of charity where I see a real deficiency, a real defect in those so-called conservative Catholics who are disparaging the Pope, who are maligning the Pope, who are criticizing the Pope in a way that is not charitable. It is sad, the scandal in the church. It is sad that there's a homosexual lobby, there's a lavender mafia, there's a communist mafia, there's a Freemason mafia, there's a satanic mafia. Some are drawn to homosexual lifestyle. Some are drawn to the Gnostic worldview. Some are drawn to a highly rationalistic Satanism. Some are drawn to wealth and power and glory on this earth, which are fading away, but which they cling to nonetheless, thinking that it can bring them pleasure or that it can bring them happiness. Well, they cling in vain to these things that are passing away. But Noah clung not to the vain things that are passing away. Noah clung to God Almighty in spite of the mockery and derision that he was subject to. And St. Peter did the same. Now, you can obviously point to the character flaws of both Noah and St. Peter, but the essential point that unifies them, and that unifies them, I would argue, with all of the popes, no matter how horrific they have been in the Middle Ages, for example, some of the popes that we talk about. I've talked about Pope Benedict the Ninth and what a despicable character he was. But even the worst of the popes share in that unity of the essential role that was given to them, along with the keys keys to the kingdom. Now, like I said, I don't want to draw an exact equivalence between the keys that Noah had and the keys that the popes have. Noah is the type. The popes are the anti-type. They are the true fulfillment of that shadow which we see in Noah. But I think it's important to focus on Noah because it's so clear. It's so simple. Any eighth grader can tell you that if you didn't get on that ship, you drowned, you perished. We can see the invitation being given over the hundred years that Noah built his ark. We can see him going out and spreading the good news and warning people prophetically about the doom that awaits them if they don't humble themselves. And this is the key, humility. If you don't humble yourself and get into the ark, you're doomed. Now, people were marrying and being given in marriage. People were partying and celebrating and admiring the beauty of the universe and the beauty of the humans around them and feeling very complacent in their comfortable lifestyles. Now, of course, there were rich and poor who perished in the flood and the poor faced the same struggles that the poor face throughout space and time, which is just basic survival. But even they 
those who perished, those who were poor, even they were indulging in things that passed away. They were emphasizing things that passed away. They were clinging to things that ultimately passed away in the flood. And we are in the same situation. We have to listen to the Pope. We have to listen to the invitation to get into the ark. We need to trust Peter. Even though he seems on the surface to be a shady character, an impulsive character, he seems to be a character that is not 100% trustworthy and reliable. So we need to go beyond the human and we need to look at the divine call. We need to look at those keys that he holds. We need to conclude that in spite of Peter, God can work through Peter and God can achieve salvation of his chosen people through Peter. We face the same challenge. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be respectful when we hear gossip, when we hear news reports about what the Pope thought, what the Pope said, what the Pope did. We need to be very, very cautious because the devil is working to draw us away from Peter. The devil doesn't want us to get into the ark. The devil wants to use clever arguments. The devil wants to use facts. This is a word that I'm having shoved down my throat time and time again when I suggest to ostensibly faithful Catholics that they should perhaps refrain from rash judgment. They claim that it is merely facts that they are presenting. It is a fact that Pope Francis commissioned a five-volume work in defense of a convicted sex abuser and pedophile. They claim that this is a fact, an indisputable fact, and they send me links to anti-Catholic videos, which are sensational. The facts are the facts, but do you have sufficient access to the facts? Are you in a position to judge? This five-volume work that is cited in the case of Grassi in Argentina, when then Archbishop Bergoglio gave his stamp of approval to this work, I just sent an email today to the lawyer that is responsible for this five-volume work. He's an Argentinian doctor of the law. I don't expect a reply because he's a very busy man and I'm a nobody. But to get back to this five-volume work, it's something like 3,000 pages of documentation put together by the Argentinian Episcopal Conference under the authority of then Archbishop Bergoglio, now Pope Francis. But everything that I've found that cites this document cites the same few handful of paragraphs. I don't even know if they're reliable citations. How would I know? You know, these are anti-Catholic websites that are presenting the same sensational paragraphs, which seem to attack and blame the victims of sexual abuse of a known and convicted pedophile. Doesn't look too good, does it? But to be very generous, if we say we have one page of text from a 3,000 page document, what do the other 2,999 pages say? What did they say? I don't, I'm not even convinced that the citations given by these anti-Catholic videos and websites are legitimate or reliable. I've seen so many, so many lies and errors about the church that I don't just accept what I read. I don't just read something online and say, oh, it must be true. Six websites say the same thing. They're quoting the same three sentences. Must be true. Oh, there's your fact. So... I think we really need to be cautious. And those that claim that they're merely stating facts and that they're not engaging in opinion, that they're not undermining the authority and the dignity, the human dignity of the person who is Pope, if they claim that they're just presenting the facts, they are in error. The facts are so much wider and broader and deeper than what they have access to, that it is foolishness to come to a conclusion based on a handful of sentences, which allegedly come from this 3,000 page document in five volumes. You know, reality is very complicated. I think about the 
attack on the character of Pope Pius XII, people can sit in their armchair and they can make a, a, a judgment based on a play that they saw, a play that denigrates his character very aggressively and openly, and which does not respect the truth. I have no doubt that there are some facts in that play, the famous play that destroyed the reputation of Pope Pius XII, or at least tried to. But people that are willing to accept so quickly and so easily these loose and superficial cultural presentations of so-called facts, along with the conclusions that those cultural presentations come to, if not explicitly, then at least implicitly. These people are falling away from the truth. These people are falling away from Jesus Christ. Because I have no doubt that Pope Pius XII is not the monster that he's portrayed to be in that famous play. I think it's called The Deputy. It was written in 1963 by Rolf Huhut. And it did not portray Pope Pius XII in a very nice light. It showed him as being weak and failing to speak out. But my point here is not that there's a conspiracy to discredit the Vatican. My point here is that Satan wants to destroy the church and Satan will use whatever means, any means and every means. Homosexuality, pedophilia, sexual abuse, abuse of any kind, lies, propaganda, plays, cocktail parties, dinners, orgies, anything. It doesn't matter. It could be church militant. It could be life site news. It could be Dr. Taylor Marshall. It could be me. It could be you. It could be anyone. Satan uses everything and everyone that he can. Satan wants to sift Pope Francis too, but Jesus Christ won't allow it. You see, this is, this is the reason why I defend the Pope because God Almighty has given him the keys. God Almighty is protecting him. Satan wants to use and abuse the Pope. He'd like nothing more, but the Holy Spirit is protecting the Pope. God Almighty is protecting the Pope. So if Satan can't have the kind of access that he'd like to have, he'll go for the cardinals, he'll go for the bishops, he'll go for the priests, he'll go for the deacons, he'll go for the church council and the committee and this and that. He'll, he'll use the people in the pews. He'll use everyone. He'll use the media, the Catholic media, the secular media. Satan will use everyone and anyone that he can to the fullest extent possible. And Satan does not sleep and he's pretty smart. He's a fool, but he's smart. So we should not be surprised there's scandal in the church, but we must recall the words of St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa that it is a sin to fall into scandal. It is a sin to succumb to scandal. Satan laughs at you when you fall into scandal, when you accept scandal, and when you stumble in your faith because of his dirty tricks. Satan's laughing. He's enjoying it. It's a false joy, but it's a joy nonetheless that we should avoid giving him. Don't succumb to scandal. Don't be a rebel. Satan is a rebel. If you are a rebel, you are imitating not Jesus Christ. You are imitating Satan. Speaking for myself, I've never heard anything from Pope Francis that I disagree with. Nothing. Why? Not because there isn't opportunity to listen to Satan's lies and to interpret things that the Pope teaches as rupture, as being a rupture from tradition. No, of course there's ample opportunity. Jesus Christ was a stumbling stone. Do you think that Pope Francis is not a stumbling stone? He's the vicar of Christ. So he's the vicar of the stumbling stone. So we need to be on guard. So yes, I have the opportunity, just like everyone else, just like the rad trads and the set of cantists and these so-called conservative Catholics, I have the opportunity to interpret everything and anything as rupture from the tradition of the church. It's easy. You think I can't play that game? Do you think I don't know how to interpret things contrary to the tradition of the church? I can interpret absolutely anything and everything as contrary to tradition. Give me any verse from the Bible. I can twist it and interpret it in a way that contradicts the tradition of the church. 
give me any quote from any saint, and I can twist it to be rupture rather than continuity. Any idiot can do that. But you need to have a clear conscience. You need to be pure of heart in order to give the benefit of the doubt to the Pope and to the saints and to the person in the pew next to you. You need, you need to have a pure conscience in order to give the benefit of the doubt to Grassi, who is a, allegedly a pedophile. I think he's doing 15 years in prison now. I'm not sure about that. I don't look into the details on these things. I'm, I'm not interested. I'm really not interested. So many people are fascinated by the scandal and by the gossip and by the salacious news. Why do I need to hear about an orgy? All I need to know is that it's not the Holy Spirit that inspired the orgy. I don't care who was there. I don't care what they did. I don't care how much it cost. I don't care the date and the time and the address. And I, I, I don't need to see the faces of these hapless fools who engaged in this criminal and sinful behavior. I don't need to fill my heart and soul and mind with images of these creeps. What possible benefit can I derive from digging into this scandal or that scandal or this alleged crime or that one? If you're in a position to advance a criminal case, then it's your duty and responsibility to help advance it. You can't shove a stick into the spokes of justice. You can't do that. But you also can't assume that the Pope and his minions, the faithful Catholics who teach in union with the Pope, that they're shoving sticks into the wheels of justice. When you're making absurd accusations against the magisterium of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, do you think you're being Catholic? Do you think you're being faithful? When you're laying on your deathbed, what are you more likely to regret? Honestly, be honest now. You're laying on your deathbed. You've considered yourself a Catholic during your short pilgrimage here on this planet. So you're now you're dying, you're laying on your deathbed. Which of these statements do you think is going to come and darken your heart with regret. I really wish I had criticized the Pope more. I wish I had maligned his character publicly and openly and presented the facts objectively, these objective facts that he supports and covers up pedophilia. Is that the regret that's going to haunt you on your deathbed? Or is it not rather that I wish I hadn't stuck my nose in where it doesn't belong? I wish I had minded my own business. I wish I had criticized the Pope less. I wish I had maligned his character less. I wish I had given him the benefit of the doubt. I wish I hadn't jumped on the bandwagon with all the rad trads and the set of vacantists who are riling us up so blatantly and so obviously. I wish I hadn't fallen prey to Satan the snare, which is now so obvious as I lay here dying and preparing for judgment. I wish I hadn't treated the Vicar of Christ like a dog and denied him the dignity that is due to him, not only because he's the vicar of Christ, but because he's a human being. If you trample on the dignity of a human being, this is a grave sin. I was just reading the official biography the other day on the Vatican website, and I found it prophetic that he included on his official biography this phrase. If you follow Christ you understand that trampling on a person's dignity is a serious sin. This quote comes directly from the biography of Pope Francis on the Vatican website. It's very prophetic because many today are trampling upon the dignity of the Holy Father. Another trick that those who would disparage the Pope's character like to use is the trick of infallibility. Oh, well, I don't criticize the infallible teachings. I only criticize everything else. Well, guess what? You have to submit to everything else. The church teaches very clearly. For example, in the First Vatican Council in 1870, the dogmatic constitution on the church states, and I quote, the faithful of whatever right and dignity, both as separate individuals and all together, are bound by a duty of hierarchical submission and true obedience, not only in things pertaining to faith and morals, but also in those which pertain to the discipline and government of the church spread over the whole world, so that the Church of Christ, protected not only by the Roman Pontiff, but by the unity of communion, as well as of the profession of the same faith, is one flock 
under the one highest shepherd. This is the doctrine of Catholic truth from which no one can deviate and keep his faith and salvation. End quote. This tells us very clearly that the church has always taught that it is not only those infallible teachings that we need to submit to. Of course not. What would that mean if we could limit our respect and submission only to the infallible teachings of the magisterium? What would that look like, practically speaking? Another weak argument that these so-called Catholics use to defend their attack on the Pope is that St. Paul corrected St. Peter at the First Council of Jerusalem. Well, only a fool would deny that Paul corrected Peter, but only a fool would claim to be St. Paul to St. Peter today. In other words, who is Paul to Peter in the Vatican today? Who is Paul to Pope Francis today? Is it really the millions of rad trads inside of Acantists and so-called conservative Catholics who are attacking him? Is that Paul? This Leviathan, this monster, this multi-headed beast of people sitting in armchairs, geographically distant from the Pope, philosophically distant from the Pope, theologically distant from the Pope, ecclesiologically distant from the Pope, distant from the Pope in every way possible. And that Leviathan, that hateful monster, that violent, fickle beast is St. Paul to Pope Francis? Really? Is that what you think? Are you comfortable saying that? I'm not. I see the demons, the hordes of demons infesting the man who called himself Legion. I see the hordes of demons infesting Judas, where he refused to repent. I see the hordes of demons infesting Cain, who refused to repent. That's what I see in the rabble. That's what I see in the mob with the pitchforks coming for Pope Francis. I see legions of demons. I don't see St. Paul. If St. Paul were alive today, do you really think that he would launch a podcast mocking and ridiculing the Pope, the Vicar of Christ? No. Would St. Paul run into hiding and say he fears for his life? All this hero worship of Vigano reminds me of Archbishop Lefebvre in the 60s who separated himself from the Pope and from the Church and from the Second Vatican Council. He felt superior to all of it, and he separated himself. If you look at the letter that was sent from Pope Paul VI in 1976, calling him back to communion, calling him back to Holy Mother Church, calling him back to submission, docile and obedient submission to the Pope and to the Magisterium and to ultimately to Jesus Christ, you see the same tone, the same affectionate and loving but firm tone that Cardinal Willet used in his open letter to Vigano. People are bashing Willet. People are bashing the Pope. People are bashing me. Not to the same extent, obviously, because I'm, no I'm an absolute nobody and I'm not on anyone's radar. But those who I've engaged with are not too happy. Even Dr. Taylor Marshall responded to one of my comments on one of his videos where I said that I'm with Cardinal Ouellet on this issue. And I quoted Cardinal Ouellet, who said, among other things, and I quote, Responding to your unjust and unjustified attack, dear Vigano, I therefore conclude that the accusation is a political maneuver without any real foundation to be able to incriminate the Pope. And I repeat that it is deeply wounding to the Church's communion. End quote. That's from Cardinal Willett. I love and admire him and respect him for speaking out against Vigano's rebellion and because he is faithful. He's faithful to the Pope. That's why I love and respect Cardinal Willett. Now, could it turn out that Cardinal Willett is a wolf in sheep's clothing? Sure. Nothing would surprise me. I'm not naive. I'm not stupid. But I give the benefit of the doubt to people. I love and respect every human, including the world's sickest pedophile and the world's most deranged Satanist. I love and respect them. Now, obviously, I have a little bit more respect for people who are oriented towards Christ and who are moving freely and rationally toward Christ. I have a bit more respect for them. 
obviously for obvious reasons. Why? Because they're more real. If you are oriented any other way, you're falling away from dignity, you're falling away from personhood, you're just falling away from Jesus Christ and from reality itself. So obviously the amount of respect that I can have for you when you're falling away is diminished. I love and respect Satan, but that love and respect is very limited. It's diminishing as his reality diminishes. And it's the same with those who align themselves with Satan. It's the same with those who oppose Jesus Christ and his church and his vicar on earth. They are falling away. Whether they know it or not, they're falling away from Christ. They're falling away from reality. So I've had some interesting reactions in the comments on some YouTube videos where I've stated my support of the Pope and I've warned people against falling away from Jesus Christ by playing these left and right political games. And uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall openly admitted that there is a right side of center. And I pointed that out. I said, there is no right side of center. We, there's only the center. If you think there's some mythical fairyland, some utopia, somewhere to the right of center, then you're just deluded. You're just wrong. Same thing for those on the left. If you think that the left is superior, then you're denigrating the center, and the center is Jesus Christ. And then I had a bunch of people saying, oh, you're a centrist politically. Completely missing my point. I'm not a centrist politically. I'm for the center, the true center, not some phony center. The phony left, the phony right, and the phony center are man-made nonsense. If you're clinging to that, if you're playing that game, you're falling away from the center, the center, Jesus Christ. So no, I'm not a centrist politically. I'm not anything politically. I'm a Catholic. It really is silly and childish to think that there's a right and there's a left and there's a center on some political spectrum. Clusters of principles and ideals and planks and a platform and all this sort of nonsense. Can anyone take this seriously? Can anyone really truly say that, oh, my political identity is superior to someone else's. Well, yeah, there are degrees of foolishness. There are degrees of idiocy. There are degrees of evil. Yeah, sure. Some forms of government and some man-made political systems are better than others. But to be attached to that in the context of being a Catholic person, talking about scandal in the church, talking about pedophilia, talking about the, the role of the Pope in the church, and to try to sell conservatism or liberalism or centrism or anything else is to completely miss the point. You have completely missed the point. You're playing a different game. You're worldly. How can you not see that? You, you are worldly. You who are flying banners and making parades, whether it's a gay pride parade or whether it's a Republican Party parade or a centrist parade or whatever it is, if you're flying that banner, then you're not flying the banner of Jesus Christ. And like I said, if you feel the need to prefix the word Catholic with traditional, I'm a traditional Catholic, or conservative, I'm a conservative Catholic, or liberal, or libertarian, or centrist, or moderate, or cafeteria, if I'm saying I'm a cafeteria Catholic, am I more or less Catholic than someone who simply understands that they are a Catholic? Obviously, the cafeteria Catholic is admitting that his Catholicism is compromised. It's the same thing with those who appendage the prefix pro-choice to Catholic. I'm a pro-choice Catholic. Well, you've just diminished your Catholicism, if not outright destroyed it. It's the same with any other prefix. I'm a Marxist Catholic. I'm a feminist Catholic. I'm a Jungian Catholic. I'm a Hegelian Catholic. Or any other prefix. You've strayed from the center, the true center. That center which is everywhere. God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. If you prefix Catholic with anything, you've strayed from the center. You've strayed from Jesus Christ. You're falling away from Jesus Christ. Now, are you doomed? Are you condemned to eternal damnation? No, you've got time. You can repent. You can leave your childish toys of political identity and you can orient yourself towards Jesus Christ and strive to follow him and submit to Jesus Christ, which means necessarily submitting to the vicar of Jesus Christ. Now, if you read through the comment section on 
Taylor Marshall's videos. You'll see a lot of open set of Vacantists, SSPX, Radtrads, those who are openly anti-Catholic, and people don't recognize it or they're just happy to be taken in by it for whatever reason. But it's all political nonsense. And this is exactly what Cardinal Willette said in his open letter. And that's why I quoted it on Taylor Marshall's video. And he responded, when I, when I quoted Willette, who said that this was an unjust and unjustified attack by Vigano, and that it was a political maneuver without any foundation to incriminate the Pope, and that it is wounding to the Church's communion, Dr. Taylor Marshall replied to my comment, and he said, and I quote, Tell that to a child or teen that was raped by a Catholic cleric and received no justice. Vigano is exposing how cardinals and high-ranking clerics receive special treatment. It's wrong. It needs to be revealed. End quote. That's Dr. Taylor Marshall responding to my Cardinal Willette quote. So I replied and I said, thank you for your comment. But if you think that you thirst for justice... Just imagine how the Vicar of Justice Incarnate feels. For the love of Christ, let's not pretend that we are superior to the Holy Father in any way. End quote. Of course, there are people that are taller than the Pope, and they are free to admit that. But they can't boast about it, and they can't become vain about it. There are people that have a higher IQ than the Pope, but they shouldn't boast about it or brag about it. So there are people that are superior to the Pope in some ways, but none of those ways matter. You don't need a high IQ to go to heaven. You don't need to be tall to go to heaven. What is essential here? What is essential is that we see Noah. We see the antitype of Noah, St. Peter, in the Pope. We see that, and we see the keys, and we say, I'm getting in. God ordained it that if you're in, you're safe, and if you're out, you're doomed. So I'm getting in. That's it. Why point out the mole on his nose? Why point out his thinning gray hair? Why point out his distended belly? Why point out this flaw or that flaw? Why point out that he could have done better when he handled this nightmare situation? Why point out that you think he could have done better when he handled that nightmare situation? Why point out that you think you could do better as Pope? Why point out that there's been no Pope since 1958 and that Vatican II is a joke? Why do that? Because you're a follower of Satan and because you don't love Jesus Christ. You hate Jesus Christ and you want to destroy his church. That's the reason. There is no other reason. You're going down and you want to bring as many with you as possible. But it's not too late to repent. Get into the boat. How do you get into the boat? Stop attacking the one who stands at the door of the boat. Stop attacking the one who stands with the keys to the boat. Get into the boat. Submit humbly to Noah, St. Peter, and Pope Francis. Submit. Kiss his ring. Kiss his hand. Kiss his feet. Bend low, stoop, and go into the humble wooden door of the humble pitch black ark. Shut your mouth, mind your business, get in the ark, and have life eternal. Or sit outside at a great distance from everything that is good and complain and criticize and mock and ridicule. The choice is yours. It's always been the same. Cain had that choice, Abel had that choice, Judas had that choice, Peter had that choice, Vigano had that choice, Willette had that choice. I have that choice and you have that choice. Choose life while you still have time. This is my stern warning and my friendly advice to friend and foe alike. Take it or leave it, people. Take it or leave it. So that's it. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. God bless.